May what I say and what you hear be in the name of God. Amen. Get some water. So 2 Timothy is Paul's final epistle uh, before he's presumably executed in Rome. And it's his most personal and intimate. And he's writing to encourage Timothy. He wants Timothy to come to, to see him. But it's clear enough from the, the letter that something's going on in Timothy. A crisis of faith. Certainly there were persecutions. And at this particular time in Paul's life, he was persona non grata. The letter in, also includes names of people who have fallen away from Paul because of his imprisonment. So people are, are abandoning him. And so there must be some risk to Timothy to claim to even know Paul. So undoubtedly, Timothy is, is worried and frightened about the future. He might be struggling with what has already happened in his life, things that have gone wrong. And so the letter is, is meant to encourage Timothy to rekindle the gift that God had given him. We're not told what that gift is, but Paul relates it to the grace of God, the power of God. Now, for us, our situations are not like the first century, but we too have moments when we need to sort of stop and rekindle our spirituality, our faith. We might use the language of today and say, sometimes our spiritual lives need an OS upgrade. It just need, they need to be rebooted. Now, there are several things in our life today that I think contribute to the potential to spiritually crash and burn. The first one is negativity. We always seem to be focused on what's wrong. Our our minds, our brains are wired to focus on the negative, probably because that's how we survived. But it's a handicap ever since. We constantly are focused on the negative. And we can get so focused on it that we can become myopic. And so we get to a point where we're unable to see anything but our own condition and our own pain. I'm reminded of several years ago, a friend of mine uh, at Global Fitness Center, this is some years ago, The business that she was running shut down. And she was, to say that she was beside herself is an understatement. And I'm sitting in my car at 4.45 in the morning, waiting for the doors to open. And my friend comes up just bawling and crying about what had happened. And everything was going to be bad. There was like, there's nothing left for her. And I, I, I listened and I knew there wasn't a whole lot I could say, but I tried to tell her, I said, look, I, I know that right now it feels like it's, it's just awful and terrible, but I promise you, you're going to get through this and you're going to be better because of it. I was right. I never told her that, but when I look at her today, I mean, she's inherited a whole boatload of money, okay? She's really doing well. She just couldn't see it at the time because all she could focus on was the negative. Instead of saying, this too shall pass, we assume the worst. Habakkuk. The lesson from Habakkuk starts with anxiety about the past, past injustices that lead to worry that these injustices will continue. And then, I don't know if you caught it, there's an abrupt shift. 
And the writer begins to focus only on the present. I will wait upon the Lord who answer, answers him. The second thing I think that contributes to possible crash, you know, crashing and burning are, is worry, right? Worry, worry, worry. I'm a worrier. Any worriers here? Yeah. Oh, I think that's also hardwired, <laughs> you know, into our, into our brains. And it contributes to spiritual crash, crashes. 500 years ago, the French philosopher, uh, Michel Montaigne, said, my life is filled with terrible misfortune, most of which never happened. Right? Studies have backed that up. Backed it up. One study found that 85% of the subjects imagined calamities never happened. And with the 15% that did happen, 79% of those subjects either discovered they could handle the difficulty better than they expected or the difficulty taught them a lesson worth learning. Psalm 37, which we sang this morning, do not fret. Do not fret yourself because of evildoers. Focus on the present. It doesn't use that language, but it trust. A present tense, trust in the Lord, delight in the Lord, commit your life to him, be still before the Lord. Do not fret over those who prosper or succeed at evil schemes. Refrain from anger and rage. And again, do not fret yourself. It only leads to evil. And we're going to come back to that. Because it's absolutely true. And then the last thing is, on top of all of this, an unbalanced life can just pile on the misery. Right? Not enough sleep. Little or no exercise. Eating too much junk food. Drinking too much alcohol. All of these things we know lower our ability to handle stress, and it further causes us to catastrophize all of the problems that we experience. So what's the solution? How can we rekindle our spirits? How can we reboot, upgrade our spiritual OS? And I think it comes down to two things. None of these are easy, by the way, but I'm also going to show that what I'm, what I'm telling you, what Scripture is going to tell you, is backed up by science. That ho hopefully gets your attention. Pay attention to the commands of Jesus and the rest of the New Testament. And when I say pay attention to the commands, I mean pay attention to the commands that have to do with the way you think about yourself and the world around you, the people around you. There are a lot of other commands in the New Testament, some of which we should pay attention to, maybe some of them not so much. But when it comes to things like loving your neighbor, there should be no argument. That's the kind of stuff I'm talking about. Both Jesus and Paul taught, for example, about the importance of changing the way you think. Something that today is backed up with, with science. What Jesus and Paul taught, excuse me, I'm having trouble with my microphone. What Jesus and Paul taught aligns really well with uh, something that psychologists call cognitive behavioral therapy, or CBT. It's a process of changing the way you think about the things that happen to you. And the premise is, as you change the way you think, it changes the way you feel, and that changes the way you behave. So in the New Testament, for example, Jesus taught to focus not on the future, not to worry about the future, but to focus on the present. In Matthew 6, 25 to 34, Jesus said, do not worry. Don't worry about life, what you are to wear, what you're to drink, all of that stuff, right? That's worrying about the future. 
Will you have enough? And then he says, focus on the present. Of course, he doesn't, he doesn't use that language. What he says is, look at the birds. Present tense. Right here and now, look at the birds. Look at the lilies of the field. Focus, focusing on the present. In CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, there's an exercise that some therapists give their clients who have a particular problem with worry, and it, it, it involves what's called a wow walk. And the, the idea is you go outside, preferably with someone you know, and the, your purpose is to go out and look at everything as if you're seeing it for the first time. Look at the trees. Look at the birds. Look at the flowers. Look at people. And marvel at creation. And what that does is get you out of your head and into the present moment. And for those who are, have a particular struggle with worry and anxiety, even if it's just for that period of time that they walk, they stop worrying. As they focus and marvel on God's creation, all that worry goes whoosh, right out. The more you do it, the more you change the way you think, the more that's going to change the way you feel. And as you change the way you feel, it changes your behavior. Jesus taught, for example, too, that our problems do not come from outside of us, but rather come from within. Remember, Jesus taught about, don't worry about what goes into the body. He's talking about food, but could it just as well apply to anything that happens to us? Don't worry about what happens to you. That's not the problem. It's the way you think that's the problem. For from within, out of the heart, Jesus taught, come all kinds of evil stuff. The way, the heart, by the way, is, uh, you know, New Testament language for our, our minds, our emotions, right? That has to change. How we think is the problem. Paul also wrote about the importance of being renewed in our minds. He wrote about that in Romans 12, 2. And the rest of that chapter is all about descriptions of the kind of behaviors that Christian ha Christians have as a result of having a renewed mind. Like loving sincerely, hating evil, devotion to one another, Joyfulness, hopefulness, patience, and faithfulness, and even blessing those who persecute you. And all of this is backed up by the science of the psychology of cognitive behavioral therapy. It's not what happens to you that's the problem, it's the way you think about what happens to you that's the problem. The way you think causes how you feel, how you feel determines how you behave. Change your thinking, you change your feelings, you change your behavior. When I look at scripture, I see it aligning pretty nicely with that whole science of the mind. So let me give you some other examples. Let me just uh, talk about what's going on in our life today. Uh, you know, you may or may not agree with this, we'll see. Uh, some people have argued, I think quite persuasively, that there are three falsehoods that have slowly crept into and gained traction in the American mind to the point where, in some circles, these falsehoods have become doctrine. They are the, the falsehood of fragility. Life is dangerous. Life is we need to be protected from the danger. It's, it's what doesn't kill you makes you weaker. The other is the falsehood of emotional reasoning. Always trust your feelings. And the third is the falsehood of us versus them. Life is a battle between good people and evil people. That last one should resonate with us very well because all we have to do is look at our politicians, right? Us versus them. 
And let's take, I'm not going to talk about each of these. Let me just take fragility uh, and show you how this can work when you buy into this kind of thinking. I don't know, do you remember back uh, maybe a couple of decades ago or more, there was an explosion of peanut allergies in children. And there were studies that were done, and the studies discovered that what was happening in most of the cases were parents were you know, getting their children away from peanuts from the very beginning. Don't ever eat peanuts. Get away from them. And the unintended consequence was their bodies never adjusted to the peanuts. Whereas in most cases, children who were exposed to peanuts early on in their life didn't have an allergy to peanuts. So what we, try, we did to try to protect our children actually causes harm because we didn't let their bodies experience what they need to to be resilient. Every morning, Carolyn and I, we hop in the car and we go to Starbucks. Probably shouldn't do that. It's not good for our waistline. But we tend to go, we tend to go when uh, the elementary school kids are waiting for the bus to pick them up. And of course, the parents are there either in their cars, if it's cold, or standing next to their kids. And you know, my kids are grown. They've been grown for quite a while. And so I, I don't pay attention to the way things work you know, in Massachusetts or anywhere else for that matter. But over time, you know, we, Carolyn and I thought, you know, there must be a law that requires parents to monitor their children. And it turns out I'm right. And, and Massachusetts is by no means alone. In, in this law. And I did a little more digging and I ca came to find out that the law tended to arise out of this, remember that period of time in our American consciousness when missing children were everywhere. They used to be on milk cartons, right? And the fear that our children would be kidnapped became overwhelming in the entire country. There were several high-profile kidnappings. One of the most famous was John Walsh. I'm sorry, I forget his wife's name at the time, but his son was kidnapped and, and horribly murdered. It was a horrible, horrible thing. And as a result of all of this, this fear just grew and grew and grew to the point where laws were written. We have to protect our children. They're in constant danger. The, da the world is a dangerous place. So you can go look up these statistics. I'm, you call me a curmudgeon. I'm not standing here saying, well, you know, when I was a kid, I uh, used to walk to school both ways uphill in the snow. Uh, uh, I, that's not what I'm saying. There are statistics backing up what I'm, I'm going to tell you. So the, the odds of a child being kidnapped by someone they don't know and who intends to harm them is about one in 300,000. Now, for perspective, the chances of dying by choking are about one in 3,400. The chances of dying in a car are one in 170. One in 300,000, one in 170. If we applied the same logic that went into the creation of laws about parents monitoring their children, it would be against the law to put your child in a car. Because honestly, if, where's the danger? <laughs> the car. But we're familiar with the car, right? We're comfortable with the car. We delude ourselves into thinking that when we're driving, we're in control of the car. I do that. I'll, I can't stand it when Carolyn drives. <laughs> but when I'm behind the wheel, I'm in control. Which is garbage, right? It's just simply not true. Even if I don't make any mistakes, it's the hundreds of people all around me who might kill me, right? I can't control that. You, every time you get in the car, you're literally putting, statistically speaking, you're putting your life in your hands. There isn't a more dangerous thing to do than to ride in a car. 
but our kids do it all the time. That's, that's just the fragility. So I won't talk about the others, but what does the Bible have to say about this stuff? Like fragility, for example. 2 Corinthians 4, uh, 7 to 9, Paul embraces hardship for the sake of the gospel. Uh, today's epistle from 2 Timothy, right? Paul is encouraging Timothy to embrace the suffering that comes as a result of the gospel. Hebrews 12, 4 to 13, their hardship and persecution are taught or thought of as discipline. Their discipline becomes a metaphor for hardship and persecution. The writer of Hebrews says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, it produces a harvest. In other words, as we all know from our own experience, some of the things that we go through in our life, good comes out of it that wouldn't have come any other way. And what about our feelings? <laughs> the New Testament is like, no, don't trust your feelings. Don't. Don't. There isn't, there's no equivocation. You look at the lists that Paul has uh, that, that often sound like do's and don'ts, but one list, when you look at it carefully, they're all emotions. Anger, rage, jealousy, lust. Okay? Emotions that take over our thinking. And the corresponding lists that Paul has are really not emotions. They're actions. Patience, gentleness, self-control, even love. The word agape in Greek isn't really so much an emotion as it's the rubber meets the road. This is what love should look like. You do these things because you agape, you love. Philippians 4, 6-7, Galatians 5, 24, Col Colossians 3, 1-17, all of them <clears throat> are pointing to emotions that are self-destructive and cause outbursts. We are, Paul teaches to us to take off those emotions like clothing and put on things like compassion and kindness and gentleness and patience. And us versus them? Do I need to say anything other than love your neighbor? I mean, show me in, in Scripture where us versus them thinking is supported in the Bible. It isn't. It just flat out isn't. We are told to forgive those who hurt us. We are told to think of others as better than ourselves. We are told to love our neighbor it's on, over and over and over and over and over again. These three things, fragility, trusting your emotions, and us versus them, are lies. They are not true. It's our thinking that causes our problems. I want to end with a, a story that's going on in my life right now. So I'm in conflict with my landlord. Whether they think I'm in conflict with them is another story, I have no idea. Uh, I've been exchanging emails with our, our, my, our new landlord, by the way, bought this property that I live in uh, back in uh, May, I think it was. So long story short, this conflict stems around about $80. I believe that I'm owed interest on my security deposit for two years, for 2020 to 2021 and 2021 to now. The landlords are saying that, well, no, we're not responsible for the, what was owed to you by the previous owners. And when I first saw that, uh, this is what happened. All of this is occurring in my mind, by the way. I, I, it is, has no basis in any conversation with actual human beings. It's going on in my mind. I, I think to myself, well, this is, what, this is an $80 million deal. You mean to tell me that the security deposits that were in whatever bank they were in weren't transferred to the new owners? And you're telling me that you don't have accountants that keep track of what interest is owed in each case? All the tenants? You, oh, this 
is outrageous. And I'm thinking, they're, why, why are they being intransigent over $80? I don't get it. I know, they're bullying me. They're the people in power. I'm not in power. This is an issue of justice. <laughs> I mean, I'm literally like, Ugh. they're sleeping like babies at night. And I'm, I'm getting an ulcer over $80. This is very reason I was right. I spent, Carolyn will tell you, I spent over an hour writing an email that I didn't send because I was just so caught up in my head. And at 2.30 this morning, I woke up, I mean, wide awake. <laughs> God was like, are you really going to preach this sermon? <laughs> uh, because, you know, do you see any connection here? I'm like, oh, crud. What does scripture say? Count others as better than myself. <sighs> All right, so that means, may, maybe that means in this case, instead of assuming the worst of intentions in these emails that I'm reading, I should assume the best of intentions and accept that there are things that I don't know. I don't know what's going on in the life of the person who's writing these emails. I don't know what information they have access to or don't have access to. I'm living in my head and I'm making all this stuff up. Scripture says to pray for those who persecute me. <laughs> you know, I, I had to confess that they're not really persecuting me. It's the way I'm thinking that's persecuting me. But I pray for them and I prayed for myself. Lord, give me, give me some wisdom and I, help me to think about what, 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 am I, what do I want to do? Well, I need more information, that's one thing. I need to find out some things, because I don't know. I don't know the law. Can I look that up on the internet? Do I need to get a lawyer? Do I want to, do I want to get a lawyer for $80? Over $80? It's gonna cost me $500 just to talk for one hour. But it's a matter of justice. This is going on in my head, but it's, it's worth every penny. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, that can't be true. That can't be right. This happens to anyone. Can anyone relate to this? Yeah, of course you can. We do it all the time. We even do it with people that we see. Someone walks by and doesn't say hi. Oh, that person's a jerk. Right? We have no idea what's going on in the life of the person who just walked by. Maybe their parent just died or their dog died. Who knows? It's not the things that happen to us that are our problem. It's the way we think about them. And scripture is constantly admonishing us to change the way we think. To be renewed, as Paul put it in Romans 12 too, be renewed in our minds by the power of the Spirit. And the rest of that chapter is, here's what life looks like if your mind is renewed. So ask yourself, is God calling you to rekindle the gift that, was in, that is in you? To start really changing the way you think. It's hard work. It really is. You've got to read scripture. It should be a part of your life at least weekly. And think about how what you're reading actually applies to your life, because it probably does. But then when those negative feelings rise up in you, that is the stop sign that says, here's where the rubber meets the road, my friend. Stop and think. Amen.